Merry Christmas. This is going to be a wonderful holiday. I think everybody is breathing a sigh of relief that we're going to have two or three days with family and friends and at home and just celebrating. It's going to be a, just a wonderful time. We want to help kick off that with one of the best services of the year. There's nothing. Why am I wearing my mask? I'm up here by myself. I can't infect anybody. There's nothing better than a Christmas Eve service. And so with that small introduction and a welcome to all the friends and family and guests that are here today, we'd like to invite Sue Peterson to come up and to begin our service. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Jesus, you are a light in our dark. We light a candle of hope. And we pray for those feeling hopeless. Jesus, you make a way in the dark. We light a candle of peace. And we pray for all who suffer from violence and war. Jesus, you bring fire into the dark. We light a candle of joy. And we, and we pray, pray for, for the, the heavy, heavy hearted. hearted. Jesus, you are with us in the dark. We light a candle of love. And we, and we pray, pray for those who have never, never felt love. And for those who struggle to truly love others like you first loved us. Jesus, you have brought us out of the darkness. May we reflect your glorious light in all the sun-filled world. He will turn many to the Lord their God and will go before them in spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. What John the Baptist did for Jesus, Advent does for us. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test my very thoughts. Find any wicked way in me and lead me in a way that lasts. Every heart prepare him room. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Okay, the first reading is from the ninth chapter of Isaiah. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. <clears throat> the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for the burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace.
second reading is from the second chapter of Luke. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went with his own to-, to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. Here ends the reading. Let all mortal flesh keep silence and with fear and trembling stand. Ponder nothing earthly minded, for with blessing in his hand, Christ our God to earth he stands. our homage to demand. King of kings yet born of Mary, as of old on earth he stood. Lord of lords in human vesture, in the body and the blood. third reading is from the second chapter of Luke, verses 8 through 14. <clears throat> and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the, their flocks at night. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy to all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests.
The fourth reading is from the second chapter of Luke, verses 15 through 20. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Christmas Eve ends our long Advent season. My microphone, for some reason, sounds like I'm making bacon. <laughs> so I'm not sure. Yeah, bacon smells good. Sounds good too. We have been looking forward to the coming of Jesus, and I don't know. It didn't occur to me until just now. I was looking for a nativity scene here, so this is driving me crazy. I'm for Jesus coming as a baby tomorrow morning, celebrating Christmas and all the presents in our family and the incredible joy that goes on with that day, but we're also expecting every single day for Jesus to come back again. We know that in our hearts, and we're going to talk more about that on Sunday in our Christmas service. But our homily reading is taken for three simple verses that aren't usually used for Christmas. They're from a little book called Titus. And they're looking at practical ways, wise ways that we can live because Jesus came to us at Christmas, but also because he's coming again. 
Tonight's reading is from Titus, the second chapter, verses 11 through 14. For God's grace has appeared, and that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us, it teaches us to say no to ungodly and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And so we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is he who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for us, purify for himself a people that are his very own who are eager to do good. Our Christmas Eve reading. So the time of year, we sang several songs that referred to the wise men coming. But tonight I wanted to talk about not the three wise men, but the three wise women. I don't know if you've ever heard of the three wise women, but they came from three very different stages of life. Their names were Elizabeth, Mary, and Anna. One was married, one was single, and one was widowed. But their wisdom in the Christmas story shows us how we can live the Christmas message by saying no to the things that draw us away from God and saying yes to the things that help us to live a life of true love and joy. Now, there were also three men with them, but all three men were silent. I don't know if that says anything, but all the men were quiet. Zechariah was made silent because he didn't believe the angel when the angel said they were going to have a baby. Simeon did get to speak, but the first thing he said was, God, you can let your servant go now to eternal silence, because I've seen your Savior, Jesus. And then the most amazing thing is Joseph, Jesus' dad, never says a single word in the entire scripture. Elizabeth was married. She was healthy, happy, and respected by all accounts. But her story reveals how God's wisdom works whenever we have something missing. Have you ever had like a piece taken out of your heart? Like something you really wanted. And that heartache leaves a, a disappointment, but also a hole in what you'd like to be. The key to that wisdom is knowing that we might not always see what God is doing right away. The Bible says Elizabeth and her husband were righteous and godly people, but they were brokenhearted because they wanted a child. Elizabeth prayed for a baby many years, the Bible says, and now it's too late. She was past what she considered the childbearing age, but she had done everything right. She did everything God asked her, and still God wouldn't give her the one thing, the one thing she asked. She faced the temptation, like we all do, of becoming resentful. But instead, she said no to that. In her wisdom, Elizabeth chose not to get angry, not to be bitter towards God or others, but instead she chose to trust him and to keep talking to him. It is very wise to continue relationships, especially with God. Even when we don't think we're getting what we think we want. Because then, at the right time, God answered her prayer. He gave Elizabeth a son, John the Baptist, who would prepare the way for the Messiah. And if John had come at any other time, he wouldn't have been able to fulfill his purpose. He would not have been able to be Jesus' front man to arrange everything. Elizabeth's wisdom teaches us that trusting God's timing is better than trusting our desires. God's delay is not always denial. And the wise know that a no is not the same thing as not yet. Like Elizabeth, during COVID, we probably have gotten many frustrations and had a lot of impatience and been upset because things we wanted to do were set aside this last year. Schools and businesses were closed. Worship services, weddings, funerals, and other celebrations were curtailed. But like Elizabeth and Zechariah, we trust God in those challenging times. So let me ask you, what is it that you've requested that God do for you that hasn't happened yet? I'm going to propose that in 2021, I'm, 
that came out wrong. I do not know that I'm going to propose in 2021. I'm saying I'm, I'm offering an idea that God may have been getting you ready, even during this crazy year, for something good that he's going to do in this new year. And then we have Mary, a fan favorite, the mother of God. You have absolutely nothing to say bad about Mary. But what did she know? She was a kid. She was like 16, 15 maybe. Who knows? What kind of wisdom could she have? She showed wisdom beyond her years when she chose to believe God's word instead of her own fears. What fears are clouding your vision of the future? What fears are trying to crowd out the faith that God's put in your heart? Put yourself in Mary's shoes for a second. So she's a teenager. She's got an arrangement. She's going to get married to this person. She's engaged or betrothed. You know the part in the wedding where we stand up and we say, does anyone have an objection? If now, speak or ever, ever hold your peace. You know that part? Okay. So basically the betrothal was that part. Because they didn't have the internet. They needed some time to prove that, hey, that person isn't married to someone else or they're not a scoundrel. So they didn't have newspapers or internet, but you had a betrothal period. And she was in that, you know, kicking the tires period and seeing if everything was going okay. But she had a dream that her life was kind of kind of fit together. And this angel told her she would give birth to a son, even though she'd never been with a man. And that her baby would be the son of God. Imagine all the fears going through her head. The fear of criticism. How could she possibly tell her family? The fear of inadequacy. How in the world could I be the mother of the son of God? And then, of course, the fear that we all face, the fear of change. This will alter my life and alter my plans forever. So you can't blame Mary for being afraid. So the very first thing the angel told her was, Mary, do not be afraid. For you have found God's favor and the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So here is the wisdom. It's rooted in believing what God says. But it wasn't just the angel's message. Because you and I can't learn from that. Zechariah had an angel and he failed that miserably and he was like a pastor. You know, if the pastor can't do it right, who could? That sounded odd coming from me, but not many of us are going to have an angel. My Aunt Lenny had an angel visit one time in a vision, and that's the only person in my 50 years that I've ever heard, right? So what can we learn from Mary's wisdom? She knew the Bible. She knew God's word. When Luke was recording his story of Mary, he said she made up a song on the spot. And that song, the Magnificat, which I love hearing saying at this time of year, contained ten different Bible verses. Mary's wisdom came from knowing God's word so well that she could write an entire song woven out of the threads of God's word. And Mary teaches us that wisdom is not just knowing God's word. It's what we do with what we know. She had faith over her fears. She wisely surrendered to God's will. And like her ancestor, King David, sang a song that said, I desire to do your will, O God. Your law is in my heart. So wise people say, whatever God wants me to do, I'll do. I may not understand it, but I'm all in. But that's the final step Mary took. Her wisdom made do when it didn't seem like she could get through things. No husband, no problem. No room, <laughs> No, ma no cradle. She said, I'm going to trust what God said. And then finally that brings us to Anna. Anna, our third wise woman, was very different. She was alone. She was much, much older. And you can almost hear the Bible kind of shocked that she's as old as she is. You'll be surprised that it says she's 84 in the Bible. And for those of us in the audience who are 84, that doesn't seem like that old anymore. <laughs> I guarantee you 50 doesn't seem like that old anymore to me. But there's a way to read the Greek that says that maybe she was married seven years to her husband and then she was a widow for seven more years. So she might have been 100 years old. We don't really know. At her time in life, though, she did not need the wisdom to face the future. She did not need wisdom to endure disappointment. She had done all that. Like many of us, though, she had been truly crushed at some point in her life. 
Here's the key to her wisdom. Instead of Anna telling people how bad her life would be, I lost my husband. I only had seven years with him. We had a great life plan. Instead of doing that, she chose to tell people how good her God was. When the love of her life died and she lived some 80-something years without him, she didn't spend a lot of time talking about those losses. She didn't stay home sulking and brooding and trying to relive the memories of what she lost. Instead, Anna chose to leave her home and go to the temple every day. She served God night and day with fasting and prayer and by talking with people. Wisdom is about how you choose to spend what time you have left. What time you have left in 2020? What time you have left in this new year? And Anna could not have chosen better, and you could not have chosen better than to come with your family to worship God in a church service with other people who are looking for Jesus to come. Not only coming again, but coming in our hearts. When Mary and Joseph brought baby Jesus to the temple, and Simeon in a loud voice blessed him, Anna was in exactly the right place at exactly the right time. And that's what Anna's wisdom will do. You may think you need to run over there and do this or go over there and do that. And God is saying, if you will just be still. When I coached, uh, I love our kids talking. And I, you know I always say that when we have kids because I just love the sound of kids talking. It sounds to me like what church should be. Um, I coached a lot of kids, and some became really good soccer players later on. And some were really good soccer players later on, but when they had me, they were basically picking dandelions in the field and sometimes sitting on the ground. So the entire strategy of teaching little kids the wisdom of soccer was trying to get them to stay in the position. Because if the ball was going in an exciting direction, like toward the goal, everybody wanted to go to the goal. And so you get this big clump. And if the ball was coming at you, well, that's really scary. And then you run away, which is exactly the opposite of good defense. So the goal was to teach little kids to stay in their position. They said, but I want the ball. Well, you'll get the ball. And it was like magic. The ball always came to them. And that's the wisdom that Anna told us, that she was where she needed to be in that stage of life. And I've lost my notes where I am. During this Christmas, let's make the same decision that she did but here's the here's the challenge i want to give you every single one of you know that jesus loves you and every single one of you know that jesus came to earth as a real person born as a real baby just like us grew up with a mom and dad and brothers and sisters and then he died just like we did but he died for us and you know that now what anna showed us she went around that temple telling every person she met about this baby Jesus and what he meant for the world. The Bible says in Proverbs that one who wins souls is wise. I would like you, challenge you, invite you to give the greatest gift you can this Christmas season. Share what God has done for you with other people. Maybe even just with your family but with people you meet. Why? Because people around you at this point are more open to learning about your relationship with Jesus than most any other time in the year. They want to hear the Christmas story. And so now, matter what disappointments you face, choose like Anna to refocus your love. You may have lost a love, but refocus it on God and the people that God puts around you. So, be wise like Anna. And redirect your love to God and to sharing God's love with others. Be wise like Mary and learn God's word and believe it even when it looks like he's asking you to do the impossible. And be wise like Elizabeth and keep asking but be patient for God's timing because God's timing is always the best. Amen. If anyone does not have a small communion cup, just wave at us and the ushers in the back of the room will certainly get that for you. I'd invite you to rise as we celebrate Holy Communion on a night like this. Jesus gathered with his friends. It was a time of celebration. It was the biggest festival of the year. What's the biggest festival for us? Christmas, of course. Christmas Eve, 
I get excited just thinking about kids opening presents tomorrow. And I don't have any kids at home opening presents, right? It's a wonderful time. I love listening to the Christmas music. I love seeing the lights. That's what Passover was for the Jewish people. And on that night, he got together with his friends and he celebrated the holiday meal. But he was the only one at the table that realized the gift that was about to be given. He realized that he, the God who was born with angels from God's army surrounding his stable, that had the power to call down an entire legion of heavenly fighters to save him from all trouble, that person knew that he was going to sacrifice his life he was going to be obedient even to the point of death so that he could die for you. He could die to cover everything wrong and even just the fact that you're going to die. Because if he could die for you, when God raised him from the dead, he could live for you and he could bring you to heaven and be with him forever. And so on the night in which Jesus was going to be betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks, and he broke it as he would be broken. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat this. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the common cup, and giving thanks, he blessed it, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament, the new promise in my blood, which is shed for you, and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in the remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. At this special time of year, at Christmas, when we give so much of ourselves to each other, may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, given for you, strengthen you and keep you in his favor and his peace forever. Amen. Please remain standing. We are going to have our candlelight service now. The ushers will come forward. And they will light the candles that you have from the center row as we sing Silent Night, Holy Night.
receive this blessing. May the God who became a person and lived in a body just like us, born on a Christmas morn that we'll celebrate tonight and tomorrow, come to find a home in your heart and give you the peace and the joy and the love that he promises. Go in peace and serve our Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. If anyone has, um, before you go, before you blow out your candles, if anybody has a special prayer request um, or any special needs, I'd like to offer an opportunity for us to pray for you right now. You don't have to tell us. You can just wave your hand and raise your hand. But one of our members had a sudden illness. And it's not uncommon in a church of you know, 100 people to have someone sick. But Karen Landenberg um, had had a, an infection um, that has taken a bad turn. And I wondered if we could just pray for Karen and for Darren and her family. Um, I know my son had that when he was little. And it's, it's something that can take your life. That infection can get loose. And, and so if you don't mind... While we're in God's presence, if you would mind bowing your head and praying for Karen. And if there's anyone else that needs a prayer request, if you would just raise your hand. And okay, amen. Oh, I like that. <laughs> we will do that next, I promise. That is brilliant. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, your child. And he said, whatever we ask, in your, his name, you will do. And we pray for Karen. We pray for her family. We pray for those who raise their hand. We pray for those who have heavy hearts. We pray for those who are at home alone. We pray for those who are scared. We pray for those who are stranded. God, we ask for a Christmas miracle. Your word says that your people have endured more, more than they needed to. And it feels like this year so many of us have borne too much. And we ask that you would lift that burden, restore our souls, renew our spirit, strengthen our bodies, bless our home and our finances, and help us to have a beautiful, glorious, wonderful, wise year in 2021. In Jesus' name, amen. And as our young friend just said, it is time to sing happy birthday to Jesus. So if um, we could get Linda. Is that... Christmas and Happy New Year. Bye-bye.